One of the great things about the scriptures, especially the New Testament, is it allows us to watch Jesus while he works with people. And that we, we have two ways in which we can do that. One is, is through the scriptures and through the stories and, and the gospels. We're going to look at one from the gospel of Luke. And then we can also do that in all kinds of religious experiences. We can actually watch God working with people. And this is one reason why it is so very foolish for people to say there is no God or that God doesn't love us or there is no personal God. All of that just sounds like such nonsense to me because it is so obvious to me that uh, God is real and God is working. Uh, the scripture lesson today is that wonderful story about Zacchaeus. Zacchaeus was a, was a short man and uh, uh, he was, uh, <laughs> and Jesus was coming through town, moving through uh, Jericho and uh, Zacchaeus wanted to be able to see him. Uh, maybe he'd heard something about him, or maybe he just saw the crowd because there was a crowd moving with Jesus as he went through town, looked kind of like a parade. So uh, Zacchaeus, bless his short heart, short little legs, uh, he climbed up a tree so that, he, so that he could see Jesus. Now let me tell you something about Zacchaeus. Remember, we're watching our Lord work with people, okay? Something about Zacchaeus. Zacchaeus was extraordinarily rich. He was um, the chief tax collector for the region. He was a Jewish guy working for the Roman government, collecting taxes from Jewish people, which was sent to Rome. He was hated by all of the people in the community, ostracized. They had nothing at all to do with Zacchaeus because not only did they not like him because he was rich, the money had come from them and they considered him a traitor to the Jewish people for collecting taxes for Rome. So when you see that word in the scripture which says he was a tax collector, it doesn't mean he worked for the government in Washington. It means that he was collecting money for the Roman government from the Jewish people and he was both rich and hated because he, he got to set the taxes for people and whatever it was supposed to be, he could add some for himself, and nobody had anything to say about it. So Zacchaeus was the most hated person in the whole community, and he has climbed this tree because for some reason he wants to see Jesus when Jesus comes by. And when Jesus does come by, he stops, and he looks up at Zacchaeus, which must have been amazing to the boy, and he says, Zacchaeus, come down out of the tree, because I'm going to come to your house for lunch today. I'm going to dine with you. Well, he was a rich guy. Jesus probably knew he would get a good meal, but there's more than that. God has, God has purpose for our lives. God seeks us, and God sometimes can, uh, can do it in... Uh, uh, almost uh, perverse and pushy ways uh, to get his will into our life. If we give him the opportunity, and the moment that boy climbed up that tree, he gave Jesus the opportunity because he said, I'm willing to listen. I want to know who you are. And Jesus says, you come down. Now, Jesus was doing something quite extraordinary because Jewish people did not have anything to do with sinners if they could help it. I mean, the righteous people didn't. The sinners had to eat with themselves. Nobody that was around there except Jesus would have said, I'm going to come to your house and eat with you. And so Zacchaeus came down out of the tree. He had the meal. And here's the thing that happens. Grace produces grace. Love produces love. Punishment produces hatred. Okay, punishment produces resentment. This is why God does not work with punishment because it produces resentment. Love produces love. And love is the only thing, finally, that counts. So after the meal, Zacchaeus says, Lord, I'm going to give half of everything that I have to the poor. And if I have robbed anybody, and he certainly had, I'm going to give that money back four times over. And Jesus said to Zacchaeus, salvation has come to this house. This is what God is always trying to get us to do. It's sit time. God is trying to get us to respond to his love. 
God is trying to get us to know that we're, that you have that little chorus we sang, God loves me so. God loves me so. A lot of people are going to say that sounds very selfish, very self-centered. The truth is, that's the first thing we need to know if we're going to love others. We need to know that we are loved and therefore we are called upon to share this love with others. When we read the scriptures, the glory of the scriptures is that we get to watch Jesus working with people. We've got this class going, my sister's class, in near-death experiences. And we get to share wonderful stories down there. So a few of the stories are from members of this congregation. Uh, if you have a congregation uh, no larger than this, you're going to have several people that have had uh, near-death experiences. It just happens. And uh, we also are reading several and sharing several. And uh, after this work is done, we'll be able to look at a couple that are on, on film. My sister and I have been looking at a number of them on YouTube. And so that's why it's coming up in the sermon today, because near-death experiences uh, are kind of on my mind right now. I've read, and this is, the, this is another way in which we can watch God actually working with people and therefore we can determine from this the nature of God. There's a woman named uh, Rosemary Thornton and she had an extraordinary near-death experience. Uh, she was perfectly healthy but they made a mistake during some uh, testing surgery and she began to bleed out. And even though they were bleeding, they sent her home, and then she had to go back to the hospital. And after a while, she actually uh, coded, and, and she died, and they had to work to get her back. There was a wonderful nurse when she first went in there. Um, Rosemary said, now, now, I want you, don't, don't, don't let me die. And the nurse said, honey, we don't let people die around here. You're going to be perfectly fine. Well, it turned out she wasn't perfectly fine, and she did die for about 10 minutes on the operating table. Rosemary had a hard life. She had been pushed back and shoved back all of her life. Uh, as a child, as a teenager, she felt like an outsider. Uh, she knew her daddy didn't love her very much. She went to his office one time and there were pictures of her three brothers on her daddy's desk. And uh, she said, Daddy, uh, when are you going to put my picture on your desk? She said, when you've done something to earn it. That's what you call conditional love. Her picture never did appear on her daddy's death from that time until the day he died. Never appeared on his desk. She never measured up. And about two years before she had her near-death experience, her husband committed suicide. And when you lose someone to suicide in a family, even though you had no responsibility for it, and she loved her husband dearly, he was the love of her life, and she had nothing to do with his depression, but she felt the guilt. And after that, she began to drink. Life went downhill. She never gave up on faith. She was a Bible reader, she was a believer in the Lord, and, and she had a profound interest in near-death experiences. She had read every book she could find on near-death experiences. And every night during her life, she prayed. And one of the things she prayed was that God would bring her spiritual healing and would get her through this loss of her husband and the horrible, oppressive guilt that was weighing her down that ate at her every day. And the second thing she prayed for was if she ever had a near-death experience, she would not have a life review. Okay, what is the life review? <laughs> That's when the Lord, God, or an angelic being takes you through your whole life from beginning to end, showing you how you have lived and how what you have done has either helped people or hurt people. 
And the idea of being taken back through her life was a horrible thing for her. And she said, God, I pray that if I ever die, I won't have to have a, a life, life review. And sure enough, she did not have in her near-death experience a life review. God honored that. Anyone who gets this far into an experience, they would, they would, they would always have a life review, I think, this far into an experience. But, but she did not. The first thing that happened is she knew she was dead. <laughs> she wasn't in her body anymore. Now, remember, we're, we're watching God work. She wasn't in her body anymore. And so she thought she must be dead. Uh, she didn't have a lot of evidence of it, but it seemed she was dead. And uh, the first thing she knew, she was in this white, no, in darkness, total darkness. No light, no nothing. <laughs> but she said this was the most wonderful darkness she had ever come across because she was so peaceful felt so loved. Didn't seem like there was anything there but her in the darkness, but such, such love. She said the words of the Apostle Paul came to her. The peace that passeth understanding. She said now she understood it. She was feeling it. Well, there was this darkness for a while, but then she did, didn't know what the transition was, but suddenly it was light. She was in some kind of white room filled with light, and it was as though there was a fog all around her. And she became aware of a presence, a very large presence looming behind her to one side or the other. I don't remember which. And she said she knew the answer to this, but she asked it anyway. She said, who are you? And the presence answered, I am the original of which you are the image. She said that line from Genesis that God makes us all in his image had always puzzled her. What did it mean? And now she knew and she also knew that the image could never be fully separated from the original. That was the original, she was told, and she was the image. She saw before her, through this whiteness, a door. Now remember, she has spent years reading about near-death experiences. She knew what that door was. That was her dividing line. That was the line that when she crossed it, she wouldn't be going back. We mentioned Don Piper, the guy 90 minutes in heaven this morning in the, uh, in the uh, class. When Don Piper died, his dividing line, I... Uh, Sister was letting me read an experience in the class, so I asked this question. I asked people, do you know what the dividing line over which you could not go and come back was for Don Piper? He was a Baptist preacher. Well, we know what it was. It was those pearly gates mentioned in Scripture, okay? For some people, it's a low rock wall, or it's a, for Diana Eads, it was a river over which people were passing. So it can be all of those things. For her, it was a door. I know others for whom it, was, it has been a door. And, and she thought, I have, lived this, I have lived this extraordinary difficult life. And now, the original, the one who made me, is going to let me go through that door. And I am going to receive all of that grace and love that I have believed in and longed for all of my life. And she said she reached out her right hand to push the door open. And she thought this was very interesting. She thought, ah, right-handed in the world. 
I'm still right-handed. She pulled out her right hand to push the door open. But then she, she paused to ask this question. She was going to say, is my going through that door the will of God? She only got out a few words, is this the will? And she was told, no. It was not God's will for her to life to end at that moment. She was also told that it is up to you. God has given us freedom, free will to decide. It's up to you. And if you go through that door, I will love you no less. I will bless you. And you will still be just as precious to me. So she thought, that's it, baby. <laughs> I'm going through that door. But just as she reached out again for the door, she said an image came into her mind of that nurse. That nurse that had promised her that she would not die. She saw that nurse in her mind. Now, God gives us free will. And let's understand this. God can also pull the strings. So he's put this image in her mind. She looks at that nurse. The nurse is distraught. She's sitting alone by herself. The patient has died that she promised would not die. And she says, oh, she'll get over it. She'll get over it. So, she reaches out again to the door, and then suddenly she is feeling everything the woman is feeling, the nurse. She is feeling this intense pain and this anguish and this guilt, which was just like that anguish and guilt that she had been living with these last two years since her husband committed suicide. And she said... I cannot do that to her. And immediately, she was back in her body, remembered almost nothing about it, out of it, sedated, came to. And the most real thing that had happened to her was during that experience, more real than this life the best thing that had ever happened to her. And she understood that experience to have been a gift to her to break her out of these chains of guilt and sorrow that she was in, God's gift to her. <laughs> and she said she now had to stop using that word if when she talked about God. If there is a God, if God loves me. It had become something that she knew because she had, they had talked, they had conversed, she had been loved, she had received it. You see, it went on in this world with our blessed Lord, touching people's lives, making them feel forgiven, bringing them into joy. Here was Zacchaeus saying, I'm going to give away half of everything I've got to the poor. And if I've robbed anybody, I'm going to pay them back four times over. It doesn't look like the boy's going to have much money left. And he was saying this with the greatest joy he had ever felt in his life. We get to watch God work in the scriptures. And what's so important about the experiences of God, we get to watch that same God. And we know it is the same God that Jesus revealed to us. That's what's so exciting about it. We get to watch that same God working. And let me tell you something else. This loving God, this sometimes kind of sneaky, pushy God, this God is after you and me. And we need to start doing what Rosemary Thornton did in our living. 
Lord, is this God's will for my life? Sometimes we need to say, is this the way God wants me to feel? Since I know that God loves me, I'm feeling so depressed. Is this what God wants for me? God, can you move me? Can you lift me? Is this what God wants me to do? If the answer comes back, no, God's still going to love us. Nothing stops the love. There is nothing that can separate us from the love of God in Jesus Christ. But for us to feel that love and fulfillment, we pretty much need to be doing it the way God wants us to do it. I have a dear friend who is an atheist. He was in my youth group 50 years ago. I told him about Jesus Christ. I didn't do a good enough job. He's an atheist. I have another friend who is a Buddhist. There's nothing wrong with being a Buddhist. God loves Buddhists just as much as he loves us. God loves my atheist friend just as much as he loves us. So these two people are dear to me. Buddhists don't believe in a personal God. Well, that's where this boy is wrong. If there's one thing that we need to know, it is how much God loves us and how close God wants to be to you and me. Am I letting God get close? Am I doing his will? Do I feel that Zacchaeus joy, that rosemary joy? Join me in prayer. God of grace. One thing we know, Heavenly Father, you're working on us right now, right this minute, even today, asking us to receive your love, asking us to seek your will in our lives, seeking to lift us from sorrow and guilt and pain. In this moment, Lord, let us say yes. Let us surrender, surrender our, our will to your will for us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.